everyone. Welcome uh, to GCAS's series of research presentations, or maybe with better word, lectures. And today we have with us Filippo Scafi. Uh, he is a PhD researcher uh, here in GCAS. And uh, it's my honor to introduce him and the title of uh, his presentation. Uh, Filippo, uh, before joining GCAS, uh, studied uh, at the University of Turin. Uh, he earned a BA in philosophy and then went on uh, with an MA in continental philosophy at the University of Warwick. And now his research is at the intersection of anthropology, semiotics and narratology. And it centers around how the human conceives and narrates itself and the non-human as well as how a system of meaning defines the boundaries between objects in the world. The methodological perspective through which his research is carried on is Francois Laruel's non-philosophy and his supervisor is Professor Rocky Gangle. Filippo is also head of editor of Chaosmotics, a philosophy magazine he founded at Warwick with two fellows. And today his lecture's title is Immanence as an Anthropological Horizon, the Ontological Turn and Non-Philosophy. So please, everyone on YouTube uh, who is following us, welcome Filippo. Filippo, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Victoria, for the presentation and introdu introduction. So um, let's dive right into it. I, I will share the presentation, my screen in a moment. Okay, should be okay, uh, should be on. So um, I would like to begin with a story that goes back to 1920 uh, about the German writer and painter Erich Scheuermann. Escaped from, the, uh, from Europe in 1914 because of the war, Scheuermann lived in German Samoa Islands until the uh, 1920. When back, he gave a print to print a short peculiar book named uh, Der Papalagi, which was a collection of speeches Scheumann gathered of the indigenous chief uh, Tuavi of Piavea. The stories were about uh, the chief's travel to Europe, to the world of white men, the Papalagi, Papalagi exactly, and about the considerations mainly of disgust uh, towards the white man customs, ethics, cosmology. To TV of Tiavea, the white man uh, was not more than a child lost in a confusion of bright lights, self posed obligations and forgotten motifs. Scheuermann allegedly without uh, the approval uh, and the knowledge of TV published all the speeches he listened in the island, giving birth to a little book that uh, Rousseau would have treated like the Bible probably, and that in the 70s and the 80s would have become a tiny manifesto of, of counterculture. The Papalagi uh, questioned the Western conception of time and labor and, quote, the serious thickness of thinking that makes people old and ugly in little time. In 1987, the ethnologist uh, Orth Kain debunked the book as a fictional report. It was all Scheuermann's invention, uh, even the figure of the AV of the AV probably. The, the idea of the wise, self-centered indigenous, the good savage, the highlights that highlights all the contradictions of Western culture was at the time a real trope manifesting the actual colonialist premises which we, with which uh, the European man was idealizing the other while de facto erasing its existence. Anyway, it's not really crucial that the story is true. What matters is the intuition behind it and the dynamics that emerges from it. Um, another similar anecdote, this time real, uh, happened in uh, New Caledonia, Melanesia. The period is almost the same. The missionary and ethnologist, French, French uh, uh, missionary ethnologist Maurice Lenhardt notes down the answer that, um, that the Melanesian Kanaki uh, Boezou Eurigizi gives him. Um, to the question, how important do you think was the teaching of the existence of the spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, the Christina, for your people? Boizu answered, spirit? You didn't, you didn't bring us the spirit. 
we already knew the spirit existed. What you brought us was the body. What is at stake in this story is that in a matter of a speech, I lost my ear, but well, anyway, um, in a matter of a speech, even if never actually happened, or even in a single response, the lines of demarcation, the lines of demarcation that separate the anthropologist from the anthropologized dissolve in thin air. The relation that is constituted here between two individuals assessing their perspectives or two subjectivities uh, that is uh, expressing their systems of subjectivation manifests itself outside any circle of legitimation of speech or enunciation. Outside any circle of uh, enunciation center on the auto-grounded authority of some enunciator. A new circle emerges, one where all thoughts are equal. In this circle to be exchanged are perspectival tools, materials flowing from each other, from each and every individual into the space of exchange. And the exchange here is intensive. To be exchanged, a mode of thing, modes of, th of seeing or systems of thinking. To be exchanged are local and irreducible expression of the word. Who is then the anthropologist? Which is that? What is uh, his or her object? How can this object be, be determined if at a certain point, uh, without expecting it, this very object can point to them who are scrutinizing it and say, now you are my object. I caught your soul. Um, anthropology is, quite, is a relatively young science. Uh, oh, oh, no, I lost, no. Okay. Anthropology is a relatively young discipline that in respect to other sciences is characterized by a, a quite difficult dilemma, which is internal as well as external to it. This dilemma uh, entails the critical assessment around its own object of study, the anthropos, and the holistical approach that the discipline needs in order to thematize the human phenomenon as a whole. In its essence, anthropology maintains the contrast between a systematic rigor and a necessary generality in respect to its object. The object of anthropology is the other, but in a particular kaleidoscopic version of the same. The anthropologist is a, is a human who, in theory, studies other humans in order to arrive at the knowledge of the human being with a capital H and capital B, and or, couple, or caps lock if you want. This objectification, however, which is in danger to happen, to happen under particular representational stack structures, namely that of the anthropologist, calls for a second subsequent task internal to the inquiry itself. Anthropology does not only need to define its object, but at the same time, it needs to make sense of and justice to it. It is not in fact the plain matter of providing appropriate representations in respect to the object of inquiry. At stake, there is the acknowledgement that the act of objectifying the other in terms of other human amounts to objectify in return the other of me, the alterity sameness. The danger of penetrating into alterity in order to exorcise it, in order to integrate it into the eye of the observer, uh, into its system of representation, is always lurking. The danger uh, for anthropology to be a war apparat, waging war under the banner of nature or the human, but even of justice, equality, difference, is always there. Like philosophy, Anthropology maintains a quite perverse relationship with, it, with its own end, its conclusion or its satisfaction as a discipline of knowledge. On the one hand, it seems to want, like other scientists, to be, capsule, to be the capsule within which its object is contained. On the other, a certain drive toward unsatisfaction with each and every fixed and all combust representation of the other is reproduced. Um, since... Uh, since the 90s, so, well, these questions are the main questions re relating to the actual uh, discipline of anthropology that interested, interest me. How will, has the evolution of anthropology paradigms influenced the way anthropologists approach their research object, objects? And how, in particular, how uh, has the ontological turn in anthropology further transformed this dynamic? So 
Um, since the 90s, a major paradigmatic shift referred as the ontological turn uh, by the proponents uh, and also some commentators happened within the discipline of anthropology. Following Martin Holbrad, we can understand that, uh, which is an anthropologist of the UCL, professor of anthropology in UCL, uh, we can understand the history of anthropology developing from a certain philosophical and cultural understanding of and relation to the notion of truth as divided in three stages that, was, that revolve around the definition of the relation between the concept of culture and nature, which is the ur dichotomy of uh, anthropology. So the first stage is evolutionism. The relation between culture and nature is, is understood as substantial. Social cultural variations are indexes of an underlying human nature. And the basic claim of evolutionism is that all human beings have the capacity to represent the word or to arrive as truth, but this capacity is developed to different degrees. With this, this is the war between superstition and science. Um, the second stage is diffusionism. The relation between nature and culture becomes uh, formal. Um, culture is not coming from nat natural necessity, but from historical contingency. It's a flattening of the ontological difference. Um, everybody can be bearer of the same amount of truth and error, but this calls for a kind of relativism which becomes difficult to maintain as an object of science. If, but if you're still relying on human nature, the problem is solved. Diversity is the index of our underlying unity, qualitatively detaching us from the rest of nature. So what we all share is to be culturally different. Culture is our nature. Um, the last stage, which is the constructivism, uh, that uh, in which the ontological turn is part of, of which the ontological turn is part of, the um, the relation between culture and nature is completely relativized and 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 not maintained and cancelled. All truth claims are socially and culturally situated and partial. Uh, nature is cultural and truth claims are so social constructions. Even even the the the, the truth claim about there being a nature. In the first instance, the word the word is given to us in a way in the way we represent it. So, if in if in evolutionism the difference between anthropologists and, and anthropologists is clearly marked by a difference in social and conceptual sophistication, in diffusionism this hard uh, separation is reduced, but still existent as the truth of the human, to which only the anthropologist has access. Um, it is with constructivism, that is, with, with the, with, in part with the ontological perspective, and I will do a, a little name dropping here, Roy Wagner, Marilyn Stratton, Eduardo Rivero de Castro, Martin Olbert to, to an extent, um, Bruno Latour. Uh, the, uh, in, in the ontological perspective, the anthropologists attempt to deconstruct anthropological knowledge and authority. Uh, e starting from re the relation with the other to shift the power to the people the anthropology is studying. It is the acknowledgement that the premises of the investigation themselves are contingent and arbitrary. If an anthropology has a task, then it appears to be the creation of concepts that multiply the possibilities of truth claims about the word, reorient ethnographic inquiries toward the world-making promise of difference. Cosmologies, be philosophies even, become for anthropology ob objects of presentation and means uh, of pro proliferation and transformation. Good anthropology, writes Marshall Silence, revolves around others' word, and it's not the others' word that revolves around the one of the anthropologist. It would be then um, the art of xenography, writing in a language one doesn't speak. First and foremost, for the ontological turn, uh, the anthropology must dispel any attempt to describe the other's word as belief and take it as a functional and, and efficient truth. In this conflict of truth, that of the anthropologist and that of the anthropologist, it is the very philosophical category of truth that is uh, relativized. The ontological turn, which relates in a strong way to Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari's philosophical endeavor, 
maintains nonetheless in its deconstructing posture a strong philosophical commitment to moral dictates and normativity. The same actually one can find in Deleuze and Gattari Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Uh, I would like to stress specifically um, the importance of caution in both Deleuze and Gattari discussion in the second volume of the mentioned work, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, A Thousand Plateaus, and in the dictate of making justice to the other. In the same way, it is important in the act of liberating subjectivity from subjugate, subjugating uh, and oppressing forces to not become a Nazi, to have this normativity put forth. The ontological anthropologist mu must be very wary of his or her becoming a colonialist. In the same way, difference works within philosophical thinking as the less authoritative uh, position, but it's still a position and a self-sufficient one. It is philosophy that asks what is philosophy and response also for art and science. It is, it is a philosopher, that of difference in particular, that disrupts and saves philosophy, uh, rebuilding it at creation of concept. In the same way, works the ontological anthropologist, may, may work the, anthrop the ontological anthropologist, wary of truth, that poses philosophically, so through a critique of the conditions, a vademecum of the good fieldwork or the just relation to alterity, but also at the same time, a task of proliferation. In ontological anthropology, the sources of critique, each contingent perspective are multiplied and therefore it constitutes itself as a critique of critique. As Martin Olber says, what emerges is a machine for thinking that is perpetually and excessively in motion, capable of setting the, possibility, the conditions of possibility of its own undoing. Anthropology becomes hyper-philosophy, emerging from the call to justice that gives it authority. As Martin Albert says, uh, arguments, ethnographic difference is translated in the activity of thinking new thoughts. So if metaphysics is the latter, then if metaphysics particularly understood by the losing Atari. If metaphysics is louder than anthropology is the eminent metaphysics. But this is true only if we understand anthropological concepts to be correlate to philosophical ones. That is, if we understand the elaboration of ethnographic material to be concepts in the form of abstractions. That is, in the extra that is the extraction of a few necessary content from a particular material. In a brilliant essay, The Contingency of Concept, Olbrada discusses how in respect to philosophy, which grounds the derivation of or creation of concepts outside the real it approaches, so always in ascendance, anthropology grounds its concepts in an in ethnographic material itself, immanently to it. The relationship between ethnographic material and anthropological con concept is intensive and expressive. It is expression under the category of utility of the material. Anthropological concepts are versions or modes of ethnographic material. They are the same object from different perspectives. Um, here, the, the, um, the little diagram I, I chose to put, like I, I made this diagram from the diagram of a black hole. And I think it's, it gives really much the idea of a precipitation in, in respect uh, to a, a um, elevation of, like in abstraction, elevation of some content from a particularity in order to generalize it. Here we have a precipitation of something, a concept, which is punctual, which is something that is just useful to the anthropologist, but it doesn't, it, it's not generalizable to each and every other uh, fee, uh, dominion of knowledge, for example. Um, in assessing this parallel possibility for the development of an extra philosophical notion of concept, grounding it recursively on the material that anthropology itself is for the anthropologist, Albrecht relativizes the, pos the, the position at the sufficient sufficiency of philosophy itself in respect to a scientific the endeavor. What is refined here in respect to some, pre some formulations of the ontological term sometimes too fascinated with philosophical concept, 
characters in the conceptually pluralizing image of anthropology, that which is which definitely is not pluralized is the commitment to the losing Atari or the difference. Is the fact that a scientific posture can and must emancipate from those operations who are strictly philosophical. Imminence is not anymore mediated by philosophical endeavor, and anthropology becomes for philosophy what the Melanesian Boisou was to Maurice Lenhardt. Much like the intrinsic connection between ethnographic material and its anthropological interpretation reveals as uh, reveals uh, an inherent horizon, anthropology's relationship with its tools emerges as internal to its scientific framework. There is no philosophical mediation in the approach of the anthropologist uh, to the ethnographic material. Rather, the latter is approached akin to the way a botanist examines a flower, examines a flower, or a geologist studies a rock. There is no probing into the essence or modes of the object. Instead, the material is allowed to speak for itself, articulated through and for the anthropologist's utilization. In exploring Amerindian cosmology, Melanesian thought system, or Yoruba divinatory truth, anthropology encounters philosophical stances that defy traditional philosophical approaches, but that should not position anthropology as the quintessential metaphilosophy. Within the ontological term and uh, its broader implications, there exists the prospect of adopting a non-philosophical stance as a scientific interpretation of philosophy. This convergence with Francois Lavoelle, uh, Lavoelle's non-philosophical project, I think, becomes quite uh, spontaneous and evident. Laruelle aims to establish a purely scientific perspective on philosophy, unveiling how philosophy, as, how philosophy as ethnic aims to establish um, a purely uh, if, sorry uh, aims to evaluate how philosophy as ethnic lies in a preliminary, albeit obscured, decision. The concept of the decision can be elucidated through uh, the reference to Luce Irigaray, uh, to her discussion in her essay, Platos Hystera, when she refers to sound as marking the precondition of truth as perpetually erased from its inscription and enunciation. She writes, once founded and named, the power of truth will enslave and eclipse the instrument that established its authority. It will exist without the material element, reduced to the medium of one of its manifestations, the, real, the realization of voice. Philosophical decision is like philosophy's voice, the instrument that is effaced from its operativity in the very moment its operativity is established. It precedes the very division get, that gives rise to the other and serves as the foundation for Laruelle's philosophy, a mode of thought existing prior to philosophical divisions, yet not collapsing into an, an a priori uh, um, synthesis of oppositions or, or, or of differences. It represents a broadening of thinking beyond philosophy's outer post self sufficiency. Laruel's endeavor relay resolved the eternal dialectic between philosophy and science, driven by what, by, by what he terms the principle of sufficient philosophy, that is, the fact that philosophy suffices for every and each knowledge. Uh, there, is, there can be a philosophy of theology, a philosophy of anthropology, a philosophy of pottery, a philosophy of Harry Potter, everything you want. And um, it's it, um, Laruel's project seeks to transform philosophy's self-assertion and self-sufficiency into a scientific endeavor, rather than perpetuating a cycle of self-overcoming inherently philosophical thought. No philosophy as a rigorous scientific vision of philosophy unilaterally position thought in relation to what Laruel refers as to the real or the one. As enigmatic as Laruel may appear, is actually referring to the very sheer and minimal posture that characterizes scientific knowledge in relation to its object. The object is left to happen, is left to give itself. In contrast, it contrasts sharply with philosophy's tendency to transform the object into a philosophical construct. So when we were talking about abstractions, uh, 
through representation or creative difference, both of which efface the real in relating to it. In Larue's view, non-philosophy remains faithful to the real not by accurate, uh, accurately portraying it, given its essential foreclosure, but by acknowledging its uh, indivisibility and thinking accordingly to this indivisibility and foreclosure. It achieves a rigor and generality that re recognizes the human real as uh, it truly is or, or the way it truly uh, is given in person. While philosophy uh, perpetually produces transcendence in its quest to immanence, because of this because of this decision, structure of decision, non-philosophy embodies a reduction, a scaling back of philosophical ambitions that isn't a new philosophical uh, formulation, but rather a scientific exploration of philosophy's essence. Just as anthropology relations, the relationship uh, to its, with its object, the other, is the big is depicted as intrinsic to its scientific methods, stemming from the encounter with the irre irreconcilable and represent irrepresentable nature of the other. Non philosophy emerges as a form of thought that gestures like Boisou or Piavi uh, toward the alleged self sufficient and declares, I am other, you are too. Instead of being just another, so you are stranger to yourself. Instead of being just another endpoint or tiresome data structure of philosophy, it is the latter's collocation into the vast continent of science. I want to conclude, uh, we're referring to Eduardo Rivero de Castro, which is one of the main proponents of the ontological turn, one of the main uh, faces of the ontological turn, relating to, uh, I want to refer to his, uh, one of his main work, which is cannibal metaphysics. Uh, cannibal metaphysics, in the words of Figueroa Castro, uh, begins as stemming from an impossible project. It is an introduction to an impossible book that if it, if it existed, it would have undone its own aim. Anti, anti narcissus Figueroa de Castro calls it, uh, the anthropological twin to the losing Atari anti, anti Oedipus, which is the volume one of capitalism and schizophrenia. Undo the Oedipus would mean to reverse the question, how should one live with the one, how, how might one live? Undo the Narcissus would, would be the undoing of the alleged combination of the subject projection of, of itself onto the word, the integration of the word within the subject structure. But if the undoing of the Oedipus was actually attempted through the reframing of the image of desire, even before the image of thought, Viveros de Castro into it a paradox in the possibility of undoing the narcissus, in producing a new map for a faceless God. If the hero of a thousand faces, if the hero is of a thousand faces, Joseph Campbell would say, why is this to reply, it is the hero altogether that is superfluous down here? It is not, it cannot be a reversal, a displacement, a rewriting, a description, or a returning. In, in writing the Papalagi, Scheuermann both reproduces the Narcissus, effacing and forgetting the other through the use of through the use of its consistency as other, and potentially undermines the Narcissus, that very consistency, the irrepresentability that produces a grotesque space, offers itself for a glimpse of a moment. To a V of the Avea is cast from Scheuermann lived experience of the other of me. And his failure is in grasping it as irrepresentable. The anti-narcissus, the anti-narcissus under the ages of difference would have been an obliged new hierarchization of the anthropologist's gaze in relation to its object. It would have been a more narcissus, even the ultimate narcissus. The recognition of this project's impossibility of its development, not being in the forward is the glimpse of the radical possibility of an other than philosophy. The same thing which anthropology seeks to refuse happens for Laruel in the relation between particular sciences on the one hand and between philosophy and science uh, on the other. A continuous mixture and crossbreeding. That of Laruel is 
in fact, also a radical critique of crossbreeding, showing it to be a biological colonialist and falsely egalitarian notion. In the same way, the relation between anthropologists and anthropologists become a relation of persons from which materials flow into a circle of exchange and experimentation, so should happen with, within science without any mediation or encroaching of a dominion of knowledge on another. An example of this, episteme of this epistemic consideration, apart from La Buelle, we can find the critique that Tim Ingold, the, the anthropologist Tim Ingold, moves to the anthropologist Alfred Gell and his anthropology of art. Quote, in the heart of inquiry, the conduct of thought goes along with and continually answers to the fluxes and flows of the materials with which we work. These materials think, think in us, think in us as we think through them. Here, every work is an experiment in the sense of prizing and opening and following where it leads. We need it in order not to accumulate more and more information about the world, but to better correspond with it. In his critique, Ingo accuses Gell of focusing on the analysis of art objects as indexes of social and individual agency. So means of expression of this agency that contain uh, in a way the free, they, con they contain in a way the real object of inquiry, which is the human or consciousness. Art becomes a compendium of work, of works to be analyzed for, effacing any possibility of direct correspondence with the creative process that gives rise to them. While we might learn much about art, from the analysis of, of, of uh, its objects, we learn nothing from it. To Engel, it is uh, necessary to replace an anthropology of with an anthropology with, regard art and any other discipline as in fact a discipline, just as anthropology. They share, quote, a concern to reawaken our senses and to allow knowledge to grow from the inside of being in the unfolding of life. What Alfred Gell does with his anthropology of art is actually to think accordingly and correspondingly to animist thinking, to produce a new general anth uh, anth anthropological theory of art. He experiments with systems of thinking. So if correspondence is to be taken full round, it entails on one hand an anthropology of, a knowledge of, philosophy, as something to correspond with, a continent of science, and on the other hand, a knowledge with, correspondence itself, as nothing more than a unilateral posture, I correspond with the real, I think accordingly to the real. That is a posture of experimentation with materials. Anthropology is not more than a posture of experimentation way before it is a call to knowledge. The posture through which the other's thinking is nothing but a material to experiment with. And not only the other of anthropologists, but also the anthropologists as the other of the indigenous. The relation becomes horizontal, becomes a relation between materials that flow from individuals inside a circle of exchange. It is a posture of science, the unilateralization of thinking, exactly in the way that well proposes, and Deleuze fails to account when he elevates difference as the last, more perfected philosophical operation, ultimately erasing it from the things of the world. The anti narcissus is the fundamental impossibility that emerges finally as philosophical think thinking's compulsive character, and the compulsion is always dealing with an obsession. The obsession being the undecidability of the real. Thank you. Thank you very much, Filippo, for this lecture. I enjoyed it a lot, thank you. Uh, it was very rich with references. I made a lot of notes. Um, I had just one uh, one very naive question. So coming from someone who was writing about something different, um, I'm genuinely interested in if in um, in this matter of the limitations uh, of this approach. So if I heard it well um, or correctly. Um, 
inspired by the ontological turn in anthropology, you lead this thought through non-philosophy to, um, to an approach to philosophy, uh, basically where um, uh, you conclude or you end it on a note of ho horizontal relations and the circle of exchange that was just a moment ago um, and replacing previous structures with, assist with systems of thinking where all perspectives are equal. So I'm just sort of repeating my notes. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is to, to sum up, do you see at this point of your research, uh, if you do, um, any limitations of this approach or any uh, you know, disclaimers where this would not be as clearly applicable as you presented it? Because it was so smooth. <laughs> I'm just, I just wonder if, if you see any limitations to this. Mm. Well, um, so like, if I find any, any any possible critic to do my own research, basically, right? Um, or or um, you know, limitations or disclaimers in in the sense of um, I don't know, just something that pops to my head. Uh, this is very mm -hmm. simple. Like, do we all become anthropologists then? You know, do, uh, some, something along these lines. That's, yes, yes, that's, yeah, I think, yeah, that's that's exactly the point. Um, and also, it's not only every, every, every one of us becomes anthropologists uh, in, in Laruel, it's not exactly that, the, the, the discussion, but it's also like in, in Martin Olbrad, who I quoted, um, there is a passage in which um, he he reflects on the possibility of uh, um, his book is is about divinatory truth. So how divinators work in relation to truth and how their understanding of truth in, in is different uh, from our understanding of truth of the anthropologist understanding of truth. And the book is Truth in Motion, which is a great work. Um, and he at a certain point he says, well. The boundaries seem to really vanish, but it's not that I can become a divinator. And as 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 I was discussing this with Rocky, I, actually Rocky pointed out that why not, my my supervisor, uh, uh, why not? Why the anthropologist cannot become a divinator, or why uh, everyone can uh, cannot become an anthropologist? Well, the fact is that exactly uh, Laruel, in the discussion about science, there is a point in uh, in, essay, in an essay which is called Program, uh, in is part in this La Decision Philosophique, and he says uh, we can see this this problem from the point of view of circles, exactly circles of authority and circles of legitimation. So uh, the knowledge of the anthropologist is is something that comes with being an anthropologist. The, the knowledge of a philosopher is something that comes from being an, a philosopher. But this thing uh, in general is something that it's kind of, kind of precedes or, or uh, uh, pre-structures the relation between the actual person and the knowledge related to the object. Uh, so, Laruel says, well, this, it's not very useful, even it's, it, it can be even dangerous, uh, because the actual, the only circle of knowledge that exists is the one in the middle between me and you, the one in which we can exchange materials, thoughts, uh, for an anthropologist, ethnographic materials. So this is not to uh, cancel institutionalized uh, knowledge, for example. But it's to recognize that the authority that is self-posed in the institutions of knowledge, it's, it's a kind of presupposition, it's a kind of premise, it's, it's a kind of premise that really doesn't stand on its feet to an extent. Yeah, I, I hope <laughs> Thank you I hope so it much. I hope it makes sense. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a challenging question. So, but it, it was just, you know, the simple notion, which now uh, I got the answer to. Uh, and okay. thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you for the lecture again. I, I think it was fantastic and I, and I hope everyone enjoyed it too. And to everyone online or later, have a nice rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.